Good morning, Splitlog. If you would all stand in honor of the reading of God's word. This is Romans 16. I commend to you our sister Phoebe, a servant of the church at Centria, that you may welcome her in the Lord in a way worthy of the saints and help her in whatever she may need from you. For she has been a patron of many and myself as well. Greet Prisca and Aquila, my fellow workers in Christ Jesus, who risk their necks for my life to whom not only I give thanks, but all the churches of the Gentiles give thanks as well. Greet also the church in their house. Greet my beloved Epinetus, who was the first convert to Christ in Asia. Greet Mary, who has worked hard for you. Greet Andronicus and Junia, my kinsmen and my fellow prisoners. They are well known to the apostles, and they were in Christ before me. Greet Ampelitis, my beloved in the Lord. Greet Urbanus, our fellow worker in Christ, and my beloved Stachys. Greet Apelles, who is approved in Christ. Greet those who belong in the family of Aristobulus. Greet my kinsman Herodian. Greet those in the Lord who belong to the family of Narcissus. Greet those workers in the Lord. Tryphena and Tryphosa. Greet the beloved Persis, who has worked hard in the Lord. Greet Rufus, chosen in the Lord. Also his mother, who has been a mother to me as well. Greet (laughs) Ensinicritus, Phlegion, Hermes, Patrobus, Hermas, and the brothers who are with them. Greet Philologus, Julia, Nereus and his sister in Olympus and all the saints who are with him greet one another with a holy kiss. All the churches of Christ greet you. I appeal to you, brothers, to watch out for those who cause divisions and create obstacles contrary to the doctrine that you have been taught. Avoid them, for such persons do not serve our Lord Christ but their own appetites. And by smooth talk and flattery, they deceive the hearts of the naive. For your obedience is known to all so that I rejoice over you, but I want you to be wise as to what is good and innocent as to what is evil. The God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Timothy, my fellow worker, greets you. So do Lucius and Jason and Sosipater, my kinsmen. I, Tertius, who wrote this letter, greet you in the Lord. Gaius, who is host to me and to the whole church, greets you. Erastus, the city treasurer, and our brother Cortus greet you. Now to him who is able to strengthen you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery that was kept secret for long ages, but has now been disclosed, and through the prophetic writings has been made known to all nations, according to the command of the eternal God, to bring about the obedience of faith. To the only wise God be glory forevermore, through Jesus Christ. Amen. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for just another day to gather together in your name, to worship you corporately in the body of Christ, Lord. We thank you for your son, Jesus, and and what he has done on the cross. We, We gather under no other name but the name of Jesus Christ, and we give glory to no other name but the name of Jesus Christ, Lord. We pray that you be honored, that you would be worshiped today and that you'd be pleased by our praise and our, our hearts being in a posture of humility and humbleness and worship. And Lord, help us do that as we prepare to, to sing your praise, prepare to hear the word preached. Humble, humble us and prepare our hearts, Lord, uh, for, for genuine and sincere worship. We love you in Jesus, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I just have a quick announcement. Our youth mission project is coming up two weeks from today. The dates are June 5th through the 9th, and we are needing volunteers to help with meals. 
Um, our dinner meals will be served here at the church about six o'clock Sunday night. It's a Sunday night, Monday night, Tuesday night, Wednesday night. And then we need a breakfast meal served at Calvary. So it'll be Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday at Calvary. And we'll eat breakfast between seven and eight. So we, we need people to volunteer to do meals. And we also need people, if you're not working Monday, Tuesday, or Wednesday, we need volunteers to help kids in their work crews. Um, we have six or eight different jobs that we'll be doing throughout that day, and we need adults to help supervise those work crews. So if you're able to help volunteer, we would love to have whoever can help. And I'm, we have a youth lunch today. We're doing hamburgers and hot dogs, and I'll be down there and kind of answer some questions and give a little bit more information down there. So, thank you. Good morning. Welcome to Split Log. If you can help out with the youth uh, mission trip, that would be great. They have lots of openings if you want to get with another couple or some other people and cook a meal or you can deliver food or you could buy food and someone else cook it, however you want to work that out. If you can help supervise crews, just get with Jamie. Stick around and eat lunch with us today. Um, we are having hamburgers and hot dogs. It is a fundraiser, but that's okay. You can just stay and eat. You don't have to drop money in the bucket. All of that is appreciated. Um, and help out if you can with the upcoming youth mission trip. Uh, we'd love to also hear from you. If you'd fill out one of these prayer cards that are located on the seat back in front of you, let us know you're here and how we can pray for you. Drop those in the bucket when it comes by with your prayer, uh, with your tithes and offerings. Today at 4.30, we have an elders meeting and we have Bible study tonight at 6. So we have a busy afternoon ahead of us and we hope you can plug in. This Wednesday at 5 o'clock, we'll be having a vacation Bible school meeting. So if you're interested in helping in vacation Bible school, please be here at 5 o'clock. If you can't make it till 5.30 or even 6, that's okay. Come on in whenever you can do that. Uh, last week, well, two weeks ago, we met downstairs in one of the classrooms. Is that where we're going to be, Miss April? Okay, so just listen. You'll hear us yakking and come on in, grab a chair, and we'll put you to work. Um, it's going to be an awesome Bible school. I have already started collecting supplies. So come on in, find out what's going on, and we can put you to work. Uh, we do have a baby shower table for Briley and Kate Waits out in the foyer. So if you would help us shower them with love. They are expecting a little surprise. So um, diapers and wipes are great. So if you could um, help shower them with love, that would be fabulous. And we also need some more volunteers for the month of June in Children's Church. Children's Church is a fabulous way to go ahead and get to know the kiddos that will be at Bible school. It's a great way to reach out to them and their families. If you have not yet served in Children's Church this calendar year, please sign up. We need some new faces. We need some new, um, you can do it as a couple. You can do it as just one of you. We have lots of wonderful youth workers we can pair with you. But please sign up for Children's Church. If you've got questions, you can see me, and I'll help you out with that. But I'm, once again, begging for help in Children's Church. Please see the table. Please sign up. We're so glad you're here. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. God, thank you so much for this time to be together, and thank you for all the wonderful things we're celebrating here in our church family. God, I pray that you would move our hearts toward you right now so that we will be in tune with you and what you have to say to us this morning. In your name we pray. Amen. Good morning. It's a beautiful day to be in God's house today. We're excited about worship. If you'll stand and greet the people around you, we're going to get started. You, my God, have saved my soul. I am yours forevermore. I won't be moved of this, I'm sure. You're my God and you saved my soul. I was lost when you came for me, held in chains by the enemy. But you broke them in victory. Now I'm free. I am free, you're my joy, and you are my hope. I am saved by your grace alone. I will sing of your love for me. I am free, I am free. You, my God, have saved my soul. I am yours forevermore. I won't be moved of this, I'm sure. You're my God, and you save my soul. Now I stand with the King of Kings. He has paid for 
my every sin and from now through eternity I am free I am free you my God have saved my soul I am yours forever more. I won't be moved of this I'm sure you're my God and you saved my soul What once was dead is now alive. You gave to me the breath of life. You brought me up out from the grave. I'm bursting out with songs of praise. What once was dead is now alive. You gave to me the breath of life. You brought me up out from the grave. I'm bursting out with songs of praise. I'm bursting out with songs of praise. I'm bursting out with songs of praise. You, my God, have saved my soul. I am yours forevermore. I won't be moved of this, I'm sure. You're my God and you saved my soul. In days, days of rest, in times of loss and loneliness, the rich or poor, your word is true, that all my ways are known to you. The trial has come beyond your hand, no step I walk beyond your plan. The path is dark outside my view. Still all my ways are known to you. Oh, no, what peace that I have found wherever I may be. For all my ways are known to you. Hallelujah, they are known to you. Not fear the final night, for death will be the door to life. You take my hand and lead me through, for all my ways are known to you. And know oh, what peace that I have found, wherever I may be. For all my ways are known to you. Hallelujah, they are known to you. Open up my eyes so I may see that you have made these ways for me. Open up my eyes so I may see that you, my God, will walk with me. Open up my eyes so I may see that you have made these ways for me. Open up my eyes so I may see that you, my God, will walk with me. And know what peace that I have found wherever I may be. For all my ways are known to you. Hallelujah, they are known to you. And know oh, what peace that I have found wherever I may be. For all my ways are known to you. Hallelujah, they are known to you. Hallelujah, they are known to
You guys go ahead and take a seat. We're going to take offerings. Did we put anybody in charge of offering this morning? All right. If you guys want to come forward with the buckets. Father in heaven, thank you for this opportunity to be here today and get to know you more and to worship you. And God, I just ask that you make us realize how much you fully deserve everything we've got and especially our worship. God, I just ask for this time of offering that you talk to people and that we listen and that we give with joyful hearts and that also that we use the money for what we and what you intend us to use it for. In Jesus name. Amen. Yeah. Hey. Hey. All right, you guys can go ahead and just stay seated. <laughs> Mine are days that God has known. I was made to walk with Him, yet I look for worldly treasures and forsake the King of Kings. But mine is hope in my Redeemer, though I fall, His love is sure. For Christ has paid for every failing. I am His forevermore. Mine are tears in times of sorrow, darkness not yet understood. Through the valley I must travel, where I see no earthly good. But mine is peace that flows from heaven and the strength in times of need. I know my pain will not be wasted. Christ completes His work in me. Mine are days here as a stranger, pilgrim on narrow way one with Christ I will encounter harm and hatred for his name but mine is armor for this battle strong enough to last the war and he has said he will deliver safely to that golden shore. Come rejoice now, O oh my soul, for His love is my reward. Fear is gone and hope is sure. Christ is mine forevermore. Come rejoice now, O oh my soul, for His love is my reward. Fear is gone and hope is sure. Christ is mine forevermore. Come rejoice now, my soul. For His love is my reward. Fear is gone and hope is sure. Christ is mine forevermore. And mine are keys to Zion City, where beside the King I walk. For my heart has found its treasure. Christ is mine forevermore. Christ is mine forevermore. Christ is mine forevermore. You guys are welcome to stand or sit or however you want to continue worshiping. It's meant to be. 
Well, there's nothing better than you. There's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing. Nothing is better than you. the mess that we make of our life and that you can turn it into something that can be useful to you and that can bring you glory. God, we thank you that you can take all of our shame and you can still use us. And God, we thank you that you allow us to be in your house with your people today to worship you through song. We pray that you would just continue our attitudes of worship throughout the rest of the service. We have trend as he brings your word today. God, just give us open hearts to what you have for us. We love you and ask these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Mistake. Uh, yes, I said that was a rookie mistake, so I didn't turn the mic on. Um, obviously, I don't do this every week. So the kids are, you're dismissed. Um, embarrassed myself twice already this morning. So I got to read the long list of names. And even though I read it uh, dozens of times to make sure I got all those names right, I still messed up. And uh, that's okay, because uh, I, I kind of blame Nick for it all, because he prayed in my small group that uh, if, if so be it, uh, that I would be, uh, that I would be made a fool for the glory of God, and so that is exactly what happened this morning. And uh, it, if as long as it is for the glory of God, then amen. But 
so, so glad that you're all here this morning. And if you want to go ahead and turn to the book of Romans, chapter 16, that's where we're going to be at, Romans chapter 16. And uh, before we get started, I do, I do want to, to mention and, and just kind of thank the social committee for, for uh, putting on the movie night last night. It was a, it was a great event. It was a little chilly, uh, but it just kind of made it kind of nice. Like we were able to kind of get under the, some, uh, put a, you know, kind of bundle up, snuggle up with a blanket and watch a movie. And it was kind of just like the perfect scene. We had some hot chocolate and some popcorn. Uh, we had some snow cones. I don't know who would eat snow cones when it's cold outside. I did, but it, it just happens. Uh, but it was great. We had fellowship and it reminded me a lot of this passage that we're going to talk about today, because in this passage, we talk about Christian friendships and Christian relationships and and how we do ministry together. We just do life together. And that's what we were doing last night. We were doing life together. And so uh, the social committee, thank you for, for hosting these things, especially to you know Ashley uh, for, for leading that. And uh, those things are very important. They're not unimportant uh, to gather together. It's how we, it's how we, it's, it, they're great opportunities for us to get to know one, each other, uh, one another a little bit deeper on a more personal level. And it's just, it's just fun. Um, and so we'll, they, they do lots of events throughout the year. So I encourage you guys to just come out anytime they have an event. It's always a blast. Um, I was asked not to talk about this, but from the movie guys, from the movie, uh, it was over the hedge and there were so many great lines in the movie, but I'm just only going to pick one. And so there it's, it was called over the hedge. It's about some animals and there's a couple possums in the movie. And you know what, what playing possum is, right? They, they play dead. They act like they're dead, right? And so the the father possum uh, gets scared. There's no predator around, but he gets scared and he plays dead. And then the daughter possum, he comes, goes up uh, to her father and says, don't you think it's kind of uh, a, like a weenie thing to, to play possum? And the father possum says, no, we die so that we may live. And I thought, that's the gospel. That's the gospel right there. We die to ourselves so that we can live for Christ. Amen. So look, go come out to these events. You're going to hear the gospel, you know? So yeah. Anyways, so Romans chapter 16. Uh, we have a lot to we have a lot to cover. We have a lot to cover today. I have five major sections. And so I'm just going to go ahead and list these sections out for you. The first thing we're going to talk about, we're going to talk about Phoebe a little bit. We're going to talk about Phoebe specifically, and then a little bit about how women can serve in the church. Uh, number two, we're going to highlight God's gift of Christian friendship and unity in Christ. And number three, we're going to discuss how sound doctrine is the crucial element for Christian friendship and Christian unity. Number four, we're going to discuss our obedience to Christ, which will lead uh, to Satan being crushed under our feet. Hallelujah. Uh, and number five, we will ponder God's wisdom, the mystery that is Jesus Christ. So get ready. We have a lot to do. So uh, let's go to the author of the Bible in prayer. Heavenly Father, uh, we, we come before your word um, with humble posture, uh, knowing that all of your word is God-breathed, Holy Spirit-inspired, and there's none, none of it that is unimportant. So Lord, reveal your glorious mysteries to us through your word. And in Romans 16, uh, let it be applicable to our lives. Help us uh, be changed and sanctified more into the image of your son. Uh, and we give all glory and praise to you. In Jesus' name, amen. So many people will come to chapter 16. Um, uh, I've read it all the way through for you once. I'm not going to do that again. Um, it's a lot, and so that's for the sake of time. I'm not going to read it again, but but we're going to go through um, some verses, verse by verse. But then we're going to hit verses three through sixteen, kind of all at once. We're going to just kind of just take some some big main points and big ideas. But a lot of people, they would come to chapter sixteen, verses one through sixteen. They're going to say, "Okay, yeah, here's a big long list of names. Uh, I'm going to just kind of glance over these names real quick, and I'm going to jump to, to verse seventeen because now here's the meat." Right, and we're we're back to the meat of scripture, but that's just that's not necessarily true. There is so much treasure to be found within the verses of one through sixteen, and it's good 
uh, for us to remind ourselves of 2 Timothy chapter 3, 16 through 17, where we read that all scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. And that applies to Romans 16, verses 1 through, 1 through 16, right? Um, it, it's, it's no different. This, what we're about to read and, and, and discuss is God-breathed, Holy Spirit-inspired scripture, and it's profitable for us. And so the first thing we're going to do is we're going to look at Phoebe. So look with me at verses 1 and 2. Paul says, I commend to you our sister Phoebe, a servant of the church at Sincrea, that you may welcome her in the Lord in a way worthy of the saints and help her in whatever she may need from you. For she has been a patron of many and of, my, and of myself as well. So Phoebe is the only one mentioned in verses 1 through 16 that is not present in Rome. She is coming to them, right? Most likely she will be carrying this letter of, of Paul to, uh, to the Romans. She will be carrying this letter to them, which is a huge, huge responsibility, uh, knowing what lies within the letter. It's a lot of very deep, rich theological truths and teachings. And so Phoebe, is she's a very highly uh, trusted person, right? But this also tells us, as, um, as Paul kind of highlights who she is, uh, he says she's a servant of the church at Centria, um, and, and he reminds them that uh, she is their sister. He uses the word our sister. Um, and he does this probably because he knows that the pe many people in Rome are not going to know who she is. They probably haven't met Phoebe before. And so he's, he's giving his comment, uh, he, he's commending her to them. Like she is a person that can be trusted. She's, she's a sister in Christ. Uh, greet her in a manner that's worthy of the saints. Be hospitable to her. Take care of her. She's a sister. And now, like, we know that. Like, that, that's something that's very simple and easy to see. And, and now the next thing that I'm going to say about Phoebe will enlighten some of you, encourage a few of you, and probably just make the rest of you upset with me. Um, when that's okay, I'll still love you anyways. I will. Um, now, when, uh, and, and by the way, you can disagree with me. You, you can disagree with me, and that's totally fine. Uh, but just if you if you want to argue this with me, which is totally fine, I just ask. The only thing I ask is that you come with uh, scripture, that that you that you back up your arguments with scripture, and it's not just emotion or opinion or even just church tradition. Okay, we value scripture more than more than these things. So now, when Paul says that Phoebe is a servant of the church at Sincrea. The word servant here in the Greek is diakonos, which is the same word that we get for the office of deacon. Diakonos can be translated as servant in a general sense, or it can be translated specifically as someone who holds a specific office in the church known as deacon. Now, there is debate about whether Phoebe was a servant in a general sense or if she was a servant in a more specific way, namely holding the office of deacon. Or maybe deaconess would be a better term. First of all, uh, so, so here, here, here are my reasons for thinking that Phoebe was more than just a general servant, but she was a deacon of the church. First of all, the ending of the word, diakonos, here is masculine, not feminine. And this would be a strange way for Paul to refer to a woman unless he's not describing her character. It's not describing her character, but it informing us that she is serving as a deacon. It's a, it's a title. It's not a, a description of character. It's a title. Secondly, it is significant that, that Phoebe is called a, a diakonos or servant of a specific church. That's uh, namely of the church at Centria. In the New Testament, when the word is used in a broad, general sense, it is never tied to a specific church. But Phoebe is a diakonos of the church at Centria. And this becomes even more significant when we consider the broadness of Phoebe's ministry. She belongs to the church in Centria. She is serving Paul in Corinth, where he is writing the letter to Rome. And as he's writing this letter, um, 
uh, she will most likely carry uh, this letter that, that, that Paul is writing to Rome. So, so she's in Centria, she's serving Paul in, in Corinth, and she's going to go to Rome. And so she's, she's kind of going all over the Roman Empire, and yet Paul still, when referring to her, tethers her diakonos status to this one specific church. And so the natural conclusion would be that Phoebe is not just a general servant, but a specific deacon of the church at Centria. So what am I saying? I'm saying that I believe women can hold the office of deacon. It's obvious from 1 Timothy 2, chapter, uh, 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 12, that women are not to hold the office of pastor, elder, or overseer, which all refer to the same the same office. So the office of pastor is one of authority in the church. The office of deacon, however, is not. The office of deacon is one of humble service. The word deacon literally means servant. Though the office of deacon has been misused and misunderstood by many churches throughout the years, um, using deacons as more of the, the elder leadership type role, deacons uh, the way the Bible intends deacons to be is, is to be one of humble service. Jesus was the greatest deacon of all, right? He came to serve, not to be served. Um, so it is, it is a, uh, a glorious thing to be a deacon. Um, and so it's, it's, it's nothing, when, when I say that it's not one, it's not an office of authority, I'm not meaning to diminish the office in any way. Really, it, it's a beautiful office. It, it's a beautiful uh, picture of Christ uh, when we think of the office of deacon. Um, and so, what? Another reason that I think that Phoebe is is a deacon is that Paul does not, uh, nor does anyone else in the Scripture ever forbid women from holding the office of deacon, um, and neither should we. So, in First Corinthians chapter four, verse six, we're reminded by Paul that we should not go beyond what is written in the Scriptures. And so, if Paul nor anyone else in the scriptures forbids women from, from holding the office of deacon. I don't think that we should either, that we should be cautious to do so. And finally, not only do I believe that Paul does not forbid women to be deacons, I believe Paul is commending Phoebe to the churches in Rome because of her faithful service as a deacon. Because Paul also says at the end of verse 2 that she has been a patron or a helper to many and of myself as well, which totally falls in line with the task of a deacon. They're helpers. That's what they do. It is not unbiblical for a church to have to, to not have any female female deacons. It's it's not unbiblical. Uh, it's also not unbiblical for a church to have official deacons. However, I do think it is unbiblical to forbid women from becoming a deacon if there is a need and if she meets the biblical qualifications of a deacon. So maybe Split Log will have female deacons in the future. Maybe not. Either way. Let us cling to the scriptures and what they teach more than we cling to, to church tradition. So again, like I said before, you, you can completely disagree with me, and I, and I don't, and that's fine. As long as your arguments come from scripture, bring your arguments from scripture, and I will welcome those arguments. I love to dive into the word and kind of see all the different things there, but don't come at, don't, don't argue things from just a point from a place of just sheer emotion or church tradition um, or really just empty opinions. Now, moving on, after upsetting many of you, encouraging some of you, and enlightening a few. Uh, now, moving on to verses 3 through 16, uh, this is where we get all of those greetings, right? So Paul's writing this letter to the Christians in Rome, and so he's like, he, there's all these people that he wants to greet, and you cannot miss the emphasis on relationships here. Whether you choose to use the word fellowship or community or friendship, the fact is this text reminds us that so much of the Christian life revolves around uh, people, around friendships, around relationships. One of the joys of the Christian life is being together, hanging out together, laughing together, playing together, watching movies together, uh, eating together, praying together, weeping Weeping together, thinking together, dreaming together, planning, having a vision together, doing mission together, worshiping together. 
This is what the community of saints does. This is what Christian friends do. They do things together. Christian friendship is a gift. It's a gift of God's grace. Real, real Christian friends have your back when you're attacked. Real Christian friends lift you up when you're down. They rejoice with you. They mourn with you. They encourage you. They forgive. They help build you up in Christ. Christian friends are a great blessing and a sign of God's grace. Romans 16 also shows us that the great Apostle Paul, even he was not a lone wolf of the gospel. Paul had many Christian friends. He had ethnically diverse friends. He had Jewish friends and Gentile friends. He had weak brothers and strong brothers. He had friends who were slaves and friends who were free. Um, he, had, uh, he, he traveled with his friends. He got beaten alongside his friends. He was in prison with his friends. He sang in prison with his friends. He was encouraged uh, by his friends, and he was an encourager to his friends. He at times even disagreed with his friends. But then he also, at other times, reconciled with those same friends that he disagreed with. And it's important for us to remember the theology of friendship. So here, let, let me nerd out for you for a little bit. The theology of friendship and community in the Christian life. So Paul's constant interaction with his fellow workers and partners in ministry was not due to some weakness in life. Not at all. It was not due to an extroverted personality either. It was a sign of, of, of him being made in the image of God. God himself lives eternally in community with himself. Before God created man, before God created the heavens and the earth, before God created the angels, before God created anything at all, he lived eternally in community with himself, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Forever in perfect relationship and harmony with himself. God has never been alone because he is triune. We, being created in the image of God, are also not meant to be alone, but to be in relationship with God and with others. In Genesis chapter 1 and 2, we read about the creation account. And God created the light, and he saw that the light was good. Uh, God created the heavens and the earth, and he saw it was good. God created all the plants and the vegetation, and God saw that it was good. God created the sun and the moon and the stars, and God saw that it was good. God created all the creatures in the sea and all the birds in the air, and God saw that it was good. God created all the animals and the insects of the earth, and God saw that it was good. And then God said, let us make man in our own image, after our own likeness. And God created man, but God said, it is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. And God created woman. And after all of his creation, God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. While God was creating everything, the only thing that did not please him was, for, was that man that was created in the image of God was alone. We were created to be in relationship with God and with people. Paul knew this, and it was a sign of his spiritual maturity to be able to put aside differences in ethnicity, culture, status, personality, opinions, interests. And he became friends with so many different kinds of people because he knew that the gospel that brought him salvation had also changed the way that he saw people. Galatians chapter 3, 28 through 29. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is no male and female, for you are all in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise. This list in Romans 3 through 16 has Jews, Greeks, slaves, free people, male names and female names, all these different names of people are in here. It's exactly what Galatians 3.28 and 29 is talking about. And so how do all these different people become friends? Well, look at the basis for all of these friendships. You might want to look at your Bible. I don't know how he's going to put it up there. So look at your Bible 
Um, if you can, if you can't keep up, that's fine. But, but this is the basis for all of these friendships. Verse 2, Paul says, welcome her in the Lord. Verse 3, my fellow workers in Christ Jesus. Verse 5, the first convert to Christ. Verse 7, they were in Christ before me. Verse 8, my beloved in the Lord. Verse 9, our fellow worker in Christ. Verse 10, who is approved in Christ. Verse 11, greet those in the Lord. Verse 12, greet those workers in the Lord. Verse 12 again, who has worked hard in the Lord. Verse 13, chosen in the Lord. People do not become friends generally by people coming up to other people and saying, will you be my friend? Friendships are made by sharing a common interest. And Christians share the greatest common interest of all. And that's Jesus Christ. We all share a common salvation. Romans 8 verse 1, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Our salvation is found in Christ. All spirit indwelt believers share a common desire and a passion for Christ, his kingdom, his people, and his mission. And therefore, can walk alongside one another in holy Christian friendship, regardless of their past or background. Regardless of their past or background. I'm going to blow your minds here in a second. Look at what Paul says in verse 7. Verse 7. Greet Andronicus and Junia, my kinsmen and my fellow prisoners. They are well known to the apostles, and they were in Christ before me. Now, who's talking? Paul is talking. They were in Christ before me. Do you remember Paul's past? Do you remember Paul's background? Before he was in Christ, before he became the Apostle Saul, or I'm sorry, Apostle Paul, uh, he was Saul the Pharisee, right? Saul became Paul, right? I kind of mixed it up, but Saul became Paul. Uh, He was a Pharisee before, and then he became an apostle. And while he was a Pharisee, He hated Christians, and he despised them, and he sought to put them to death. But then Jesus changed his life, and he was on the road to Damascus. And as he was in pursuit to to persecute more Christians, Jesus revealed himself and changed Saul forever. He would never be the same. And so Saul, whose name is changed to Paul, at one point hated Christians. And since Andronicus and Junia were Christians before Paul, that means that Paul would have wanted to put them to death. And if he would have had had the chance, he would have killed them. But now because of the gospel of Jesus Christ, Andronicus and Junia and Paul are friends and brothers and sisters in Christ. How awesome is that? That is so cool. That is really, really cool. Think about so many people here. How many of you would not be friends with one another if, if you didn't have Christ in common? If, if the gospel hadn't changed your heart to open up your heart to people and all of their flaws and all of their sins, knowing that you're a sinner and they're a sinner and you're both saved by grace. And you know what? You might make me upset and I might make you upset, but we're still friends. We're going to reconcile because guess what? Jesus forgave us, so I'm going to forgive you and we're going to keep on trucking along. And we're going to keep on building each other up and we're going to keep on sharpening one another as iron sharpens other, as one person sharpens another. And we're going to keep on pursuing God together in fellowship for the glory of God, and that's the gospel. So everyone who is in Christ, no matter who they are, is your brother and sister in Christ. And every person who is not in Christ can now be seen as a potential brother and sister in Christ. You see a lost person, you don't go, they are, there's no hope for them. You, you think, man, if they could only accept the gospel, they would be saved and they would be my brother and sister. I need to keep preaching the gospel to them. I need to keep praying for them. Don't you think Jesus knew that? Don't you think that was Jesus' perspective when he told you to pray for your enemy and to love your enemy? That they could be won over by, by his love and by his grace? It's exactly his, that was exactly his point. Anyone can come to Christ. When Christ died on the cross, taking on the sins of the world, he didn't do it just for the Jew. He didn't do it just for the Gentile. He didn't do it just for uh, the, 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 the free person or the slave. He didn't do it for the popular or the outcast. He, he didn't do it just for the wise or the foolish. He did it for everyone. Romans 10, 
13 says, for everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And that means everyone, anyone at all. Jesus doesn't reject anyone who doesn't reject him. Neither should we. Put aside things that would cause division in the church. Put aside differences that place obstacles in the way of pursuing true Christian community and mission for the glory of God. And as long as we all agree on these core doctrines of the faith, we can and should live in harmony with one another, working with one another, loving one another, fellowshipping with one another, helping one another. It is not good for man to be alone, nor is it good for the Christian to walk apart from a community of gathered believers in Christ. It may also be beneficial to remember that though Paul loved people, he did, he loved people, and he pursued relationships and he did ministry alongside other believers in Christ constantly, it did not mean that Paul never got hurt by those that he was with, those he was ministering with. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 9. This is Paul speaking. He says, Do your best to come to me soon. For Demas, in love with this present world, has deserted me and gone to Thessalonica. And a few verses down, in verse 16, he says, At my first defense, no one came to stand by me, but all deserted me. May it not be charged against them. That's such a sad verse. It's very sad. So in this letter to Timothy, Paul is in prison because of his obedience uh, to Christ, and he's awaiting trial, and his friends, his, his friends left him. Uh, Paul had this preliminary hearing, and no one came to stand beside him and to support him. And Paul knew that if they had stayed, that they would have most likely ended up in prison with him. So he says, don't count it against them. I forgive them. You should forgive them. Water under the bridge type of thing. But it's still, he was still hurt. You know, it's still, he was still disappointed that they, that they wouldn't uh, stay and, and face whatever uh, repercussions there were for, for standing strong uh, for the gospel. He was still hurt. And so the, the, the point of this is that People in the church are going to hurt you. Uh, I may have already hurt you. And if I have, I am genuinely sorry. Um, I don't know what I'm sorry for, but I am. I'm genuinely sorry. Um, and if you've hurt someone else, if, 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 if you know that there, you, there is a problem between you and someone else at this church, go and reconcile with that person. Uh, because being hurt is being, uh, hurt, hurting one another in the church is, is kind of a, it's, it's not supposed to be a natural thing, but for now it is a natural thing for not fully sanctified believers in Christ. We're still becoming more like Christ. We are, we are not yet fully like Christ, so that means that we continue to fall into sin. And when we sin, we often hurt one another. But Jesus forgave us, even though that we were sinners. So you go forgive other people, even though they've hurt you. And when you've hurt someone, you go and make things right. You go and reconcile with that person. Paul did not pull away from Christian friendships when he was hurt. He continued to pursue them. Always. He, he never stopped pursuing friendships. He never thought, man, the gospel, I, I, I can do this whole thing on my own. I can carry the gospel uh, to all the nations by myself. No. Uh, he knew he needed friends to help him. Um, and so we shouldn't also have that Lone Ranger kind of mentality. The church is necessary. The church is a gathered group of people. You're all necessary. You're all needed. And so we also cannot avoid talking about verse 16, where Paul says, greet one another with a holy kiss. And so this may sound odd, but it was a very common customary thing to do in Paul's day to greet people with a kiss. And so I don't want to take this verse too far, nor do I want to encourage anything strange or weird or inappropriate um, I'm going to be honest with you, greeting people with a holy kiss at split log is probably not going to be the best culturally accepted thing to do here. Um, but I'm just, I'm, I'm, I know, I know. Uh, I may be going out on a limb here, but I don't think that that's going to be the most uh, accepted thing. But I think this is Paul's point. I think this is Paul's point without, without missing 
uh, without taking anything away from Paul, I think this is Paul's point, our greetings should be warm and sincere. Our greetings should be warm and sincere. As, as Romans 12 verse 10 says, love one another with brotherly or sisterly affection. So short greetings and, and conversations are not unimportant at all. They are important. A warm greeting and a word of affirmation goes a long way. So greet people warmly and with sincerity. And now moving on to verse 17. Verse 17. It appears that as Paul is writing all of these greetings and thinking about all of these different kinds of people who used to be divided by so many different things but have now been unified together in the body of Christ, he's reminded that there is potential for their unity to be disrupted. And I believe that's why he says this next thing in verse 17. He says, with a warning, he says, I appeal to you, brothers, to watch out for those who cause divisions and create obstacles contrary to the doctrine that you have been taught. Avoid them. So in today's world, where truth is more and more considered to be relative and there is no such thing as absolute truth, this warning is extremely relevant for us today. There are so many different so-called truth speakers, whatever you want to call them, out there today. Few preach the Bible, fewer do not go beyond what is written. And if we throw away sound doctrine in the pursuit of keeping relationships or just making sure uh, that no one gets angry or upset, if we kind of throw away sound doctrine it just, just to please people, we, we throw away the very thing that unites us, the very thing that unites us in the first place, which is the truth of the gospel. There is no there there is such a thing as absolute truth, and that is Jesus Christ, who is the way, the truth, and the life. And in him we are all united. In nothing else. It's it's just in Christ that we're united. So we must hold fast to the sound doctrine, the doctrines of our faith, the doctrines of Christ and God, um, the, the the very core, the essence of our salvation. These, these sound doctrines, we must hold fast to them. Otherwise, in a few years, split log will, be, will no longer be a temple made up of living stones. It will no longer be the church. It will be nothing more than a specific location where worldly people gather around a false ideology that is unable to produce any hope. I, I wasn't planning on reading that again, but I'm going to read it again. Um, I think it's important. If we do not hold fast to sound doctrine, this is what Splitlog's future will be. Splitlog will no longer be a temple made up of living stones. It will no longer be the church. It will be nothing more than a specific location where worldly people gather around a false ideology that is unable to produce any hope because you've taken Jesus away. If you throw away sound doctrine, then you're replacing God, the, the, the God of the Bible, with your own false God, a figment of your imagination. No other God exists but the God of the Bible, the one who took on flesh, the one who was crucified for your sins, the one who was raised to life, defeating uh, sin and death for us, the one who, uh, the Holy Spirit, applying the, the work of Christ to your life, giving you new life. This is, the, this is the God that we put our faith in, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. They all work together. They're all one. One person or, or one God, three persons, one essence. This is the God of the Bible. This is the God of the Bible. That's why I gather here. I'm convinced that the God of the Bible is real. And if we move away from the Bible, we won't make it as a church. Unity can only happen around the truth of sound doctrine. So Paul says, watch out for these people. These people that would cause divisions and they would put obstacles uh, in, in the way of the sound doctrine, for example, like, like in, in some of the other letters that Paul talks about, people, there are false teachers who, who add circumcision to the gospel, right? Like, yeah, I believe in, believe in Christ, but you also must be circumcised in order to receive salvation. Those are the obstacles, right? We, we can't, and today, it would be like, yeah, believe in Christ, but you also got to gotta do a lot of good works in order to earn your salvation. No, 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 no. This is something that we constantly always talk about when we always have to uh, uh, kind of flesh out the details we we are saved and because of our salvation we do good works we're not we don't we're not saved by our works the our salvation produces good works in us 
but the good works do not bring about our salvation. It's a free gift. It's nothing that you can do to earn it. It's a free gift in Christ. Christ is everything. Christ is all. So if we read on in verse 18, uh, we see that these false teachers that, that, that Paul is talking about, they, they don't always come in the ways that we expect them to. Verse 18 says, For such persons do not serve our Lord Christ, but their own appetites. And by smooth talk and flattery, they deceive the hearts of the naive. So these people serve their own desires and their own appetites and not Christ. Yeah, we, we, we kind of knew that one. That's expected. But the way in which that they do it is very, very deceitful. They do it by smooth talk and flattery. In other words, they're going to make you feel good. They're going to tell you what you want to hear. Their words are going to sound pleasant to your ears. Their promises will seem sure. Like that sounds reasonable. I like the way you said that. I want to I want to hang my hat on that because that is a lot easier than the gospel um, where I just have to put my faith in Christ and I may have to suffer and die for him. Uh, this way I can just do whatever I want and God will still bless, will still bless me. And yeah, that, that sounds a lot better. No, the gospel may cost you your life, but you're going to gain it in the end. Avoid such people that would, that would move you away from Christ. They are preying on the naive. And so don't be naive. Just be, a, be a person who is, who, is, who is astute in the scriptures, who is firmly rooted in Christ. And those who are not naive, protect your naive brothers and sisters. If you see someone beginning to err in theology or doctrine or whatever, bring them back gently, gently, but bring them back so that they do not continue to fall away from Christ, right? Acts chapter 4, 11 through 12. This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders which has become the cornerstone, and there is salvation in no one else. For there is no other name under, he under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Great reminder, you should have been rejected by God because God is holy and you are a sinner but Jesus was rejected for your sake so that in him you might be saved. So don't reject the one who is rejected for you. You being unified with Christ and being unified with each other can only happen around the truth of sound doctrine. Verse 19. For your obedience is known to all so that I rejoice over you but I want you to be wise as to what is good and innocent as to what is evil. If Paul were writing a letter to Split Log, this would probably be the thing that I would hope Paul would say about us, that our, that our obedience is known to all. Because so much is wrapped up in the word obedience. The more I kept thinking about it, the more I just, I loved it and I wanted it for us. To obedient is holding fast to sound doctrine. To be obedient is outdoing one another and showing honor. To be obedient is rejoicing in hope. To be patient in times of trial. To be constant in prayer, showing hospitality. To attend to the poor and the sick and the widowed and the orphaned. To never be wise in our own sight, but finding wisdom in the gospel of Christ. To repay no one evil for evil, but instead giving thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all to live peaceably with, with all so far as it depends on you, to love your enemy, giving them something to eat and to drink and sharing the gospel wherever we go, to not be haughty, but to be lowly in heart, to be subject to governing authorities, to fulfill the law through love, loving your neighbor as yourself. That's obedience. And we don't do it for obedience sake, we do, we, but, but we're obedient because we love Jesus. Paul rejoiced over a church he had never been to because they were obedient to Christ. That was Paul's standard. Not how big they are, not how fancy their, their light show was or their music or, or how even how good their preaching was or, or how well they sang or, or how, how obedient they were. That's the standard. And the church is not just me or anyone else who's on the stage. The church is, is us. It's all of us. That's the standard. Be, let's be obedient in these things, obedient to Christ. And not obedience for obedience sake, but just because we love Christ and we love people. 
Verse 20. Oh, I'm sorry. No, this is the second half of verse 19. Yeah, my bad. The second half of verse 19. Paul says, Paul goes on. He says, but I want you to be wise as to what is good and innocent as to what is evil. In other words, be, be experts in doing what is good. Be a master builder in doing what is good. And don't even be a beginner at doing what is evil. Keep up that obedience. Keep it up for Christ. And don't even think about toying with that foolish sin. Sin is foolishness that destroys, but doing what is good, namely obedience to Christ, is wisdom from above. If you want to be in Christ, obey Christ. Or, sorry. If you want to be wise, did I say that? If you want to be wise, obey Christ. I think I said if you want to be Christ. Uh, I don't know if I said that, but that was messed up. Um, if you want to be wise, obey Christ. If you want to be foolish, begin toying with sin. You may think that you can for a while and get away with it, but it will get you in the end. It will cause much destruction and much harm. And it doesn't mean that you can't come back from it if you repent and turn to Christ, but it's going to cost you a lot of heartache, a lot of heartache and a lot of pain. Don't do it. Verse 20 now, verse 20. The God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. This verse may remind you of Genesis uh, chapter 3, verse 15, where God says, uh, this is God speaking, I will put enmity between you, the serpent, and the woman, and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. So from the beginning, this is, this is all the way back in Genesis chapter, chapter 3. This is the very beginning of, of the word. From the beginning, God, God, God decreed that Jesus would come and crush Satan, uh, the, the serpent. But how is it that Paul says here in Romans 16 that it will be under our feet that Satan is crushed? Shouldn't it be under Christ's feet is what you would think? Well, it is. But we are in Christ. So when, when the time comes and Christ comes again and we're brought into the fullness of his kingdom, we too will be reigning with Christ. When Christ reigns, we reign. When Christ crushes Satan under his feet, we crush Satan under our feet. That's the glory of the gospel. We have been united with Christ. His victory is our victory. And even now, Satan's greatest weapon against us has already been taken away from him. Namely, his ability to point to our sin and to say, you should be condemned. Without Christ, Satan has a very strong case in the heavenly courtroom against us. Because we're all sinners. And God, who is the judge, would have to deal with us. But God, in his kindness, in his grace, in his mercy, he took care of it for us. Instead of us having to be condemned for our sins, God had his son take our place. Jesus paid the price for our sins, and now we, being washed in his blood, are forgiven. Grace triumphs over sin and death. It triumphs over Satan's accusations against us. And now the worst thing that Satan can do is kill you. Praise God. Praise God. Because all that death is now for us is the gateway that we enter through to enter into the presence of God forever. That is good news. That is good news. And soon, here's the better news, soon Satan won't even be able to kill you. He won't even be able to do that, which is the worst thing that he can do. For he will one day be crushed by the God of peace under our feet. Under Christ's feet, and we're united with Christ, so it's under our feet as well. God is awesome. God is amazing. It's already, it's in the word. It's already there. It is written. And it will happen soon. It happens soon. Verses 21 through 23. So going back to this point about how the Christian life is not to be lived in isolation, right? So, so Paul is constantly with other believers uh, and and, and that's a, that should be our lesson is that Christian life is not to be lived in isolation, but, but with company and fellowship of other Christian brothers and sisters. And so we also see that Paul is not alone even as he's writing the letter. Verses 21 through 23, we, we see Timothy and Lucius and, and Jason and Sosipater, uh Tertius, who wrote the letter. Um, and so Tertius, uh, when he says, I, Tertius, who wrote this letter, greet you in the Lord, uh, Tertius was, was Paul's amanuensis. So in other words, uh, which, which was very common in, in this day, Paul is the one speaking. It's his thoughts. It's his words. Uh, but Tertius was just the one who put pen to paper. 
Um, and the thing that I want to point out is, is that Tertius was serving the Lord as he was doing this. And so you may think that, that man, Paul is, is amazing and he's great. And he is. Praise God. I'm so thankful for Paul. I'm so thankful for how God used Paul. But I'm also very thankful how God used Tertius. Because now I have this very beautifully written letter from Tertius's hand that was preserved and saved for me to read and for me to learn and for me to learn more about God and be able to love God more and to worship him more and to live my life more like I ought to live as a saved person bought in the blood of Christ. I owe a lot of that to Tertius. And so my point is, is God has been of you talents and gifts and resources to be used for the glory of God. If you can write, if you can write, write for the glory of God. If you preach, preach for the glory of God. If you work, do it for the glory of God as Erastus did. If you can cook, cook for the glory of God. And I can go on and on and on. If you sing, if you uphold the law as an officer, if you're a school teacher or you're a nurse or whatever you do, do it for the glory of God. Moving on to verses 25 through 27. So as you can see, we have come to the final three verses in the book of Romans. It's a little bittersweet. And how does Paul close this incredible letter? With a, with a doxology. A doxology or an expression of praise to God. A fitting in to a quite possibly the most theologically rich letter in all of the Bible. He says in verse 25, Now to him who is able to strengthen you, according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ. God not only saves us through his son, but he strengthens us through his son. Paul desperately wanted to preach the gospel in Rome. He says this in, in uh, Romans chapter 1, verse 15, long ago. He said, so I am eager to preach the gospel to you also who are in Rome. Did Paul want to preach the gospel to lost people in Rome? Yeah, of course. But he also wanted to preach the gospel to the Christians in Rome. Why? They're already saved. Because the gospel of Jesus Christ not only saves us from our sins, but continues to strengthen us as we walk the Christian life following after Jesus. Jesus not only saves us by his grace, but, but he strengthens us, strengthens us by his grace. He strengthens us according to the gospel. And what is the gospel? It is the preaching of Jesus Christ. Jesus is the gospel, and the gospel is Jesus. And preaching the gospel is highlighting Christ, magnifying Christ, exalting Christ, focusing on Christ, worshiping Christ, and praising Christ throughout the scriptures. Do we preach Christ every Sunday? Yeah. And are we going to stop? Heaven forbid. No. We will always preach Christ. And you need to continue to come. Every Sunday, every, every Wednesday, every, every Friday, even though you're going to continue to hear Christ, or Christ preached, even though you're going to continue to hear the same message over and over and over throughout the scriptures as we look through, through the whole word, as the whole counsel of God points to Christ, even though you're going to continue to hear pretty much the same message that Jesus is the Son of God and he died for your sins and then if you put your faith in him, you're going to be saved and God's going to receive all of this glory and you're going to receive eternal life. Even though you're going to hear that over and over and over again, we're going to keep preaching it to you because that's what you need. That's what you need to be fed more than anything else. You need to be fed Christ on a daily basis. That's why you should read your Bible every day. That's why you should preach every, or you should pray to God every single day. And that's why you need to continue to come here and hear preaching. Christ not only saves us from our sins, but strengthens us to live the Christian life, to, pers to persevere to the end. We need Christ every day, all the time, every hour. Sorry, I went off. And so Jesus is the mystery that was once hidden in the Old Testament. It was foggy for a little while. It was unclear who the Messiah would be and, and what he would do and, and, and exactly what he would accomplish and how he would accomplish it. But then Jesus comes and he reveals this mystery that God isn't going to just save his covenant people, Israel, no, Jesus 
uh, established a new covenant, a new co- a greater covenant, making a way for, for people of every, every nation, every tribe and tongue to be saved by grace through faith in Christ. And because of this great mystery that has now been revealed to us, because we know who Jesus is and what he has accomplished, we're called to submit to him in faith because he's worthy. He's worthy of our obedient faith. Verse 27, to the only wise God be glory forever through Jesus Christ. Amen. Paul doesn't say this implying that there are other gods. No, he's emphatically saying there is no other God. There is no other God. Uh, there is only one God, and he is eternally wise. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 teaches us much about the wisdom of God. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, 30 through 31 says, And because of him, God, because of God, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God, righteousness and sanctification and redemption, so that as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. So in God's wisdom, he is saving a people for himself through his son, Jesus Christ so that no one may boast in themselves, but instead they can only boast in our Lord Jesus Christ, stealing no glory for themselves, but giving all glory to God because he alone is worthy of glory and praise. And this is God's wisdom. Church, one day, I promise I'm ending right now. Church, one day we will stand in the presence of God, a people bought with the blood of Jesus. Christ will receive glory every second, every hour that we are there. God will be receiving glory through his son, Jesus Christ, because we won't be in his presence based on our own merit or on our own righteousness. We will only be there because God's mercy and grace, which was poured out on us through his son, Jesus Christ, and applied to us by his Holy Spirit, was greater than our sin. To God be the glory forevermore through Jesus Christ. And church, that's the book of Romans. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you for for breathing out every single word, for inspiring every single word by your spirit. And I know that it's inspired because it changes me and I see it change other people, Lord. So let that happen today. Let that happen to us now, Lord. let Let your word change us and make us more like Christ so that we can be better servants, uh, be better um, uh, ambassadors to, to your name and to your glory out into the community, Lord. Help us just live our lives on mission and help us love one another within the church very, very well and also love our neighbors, our enemies, um, as you did, O oh Lord. Give us the strength, Lord. You, you've given us our salvation, but Lord, Lord, strengthen us for the Christian walk and for our Christian life as we, as we go out and we face persecution and hardship and suffering. Strengthen us, Lord, as you promise to do. And we give you all glory and all praise. In Jesus' name, amen. So please stand at this time. Again, we're just gonna continue with uh, uh, what we've been doing and just pray in response to God. And if anyone needs to come up, I will be up here if you want to talk or about anything.
Thank you all for coming uh, today and for just worshiping with us. I really, really appreciate it and loved seeing you all. So tonight, reminder, uh, we do have Bible study uh, at six o'clock. And if you want to do a little heads up, like a little uh, light reading, go ahead and just read uh, Daniel 10 all the way through 12. It's only like 80 verses. And so if you do that, you'll be totally ready to go. Uh, Bible study. Uh, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to the Deacon of the Week, which is, I have no idea. Who wants to volunteer? Brian Hall. All right. <laughs> You guys of Alpha, please. Heavenly Father, we just uh, we thank you so much for, for what you've given us and uh, all your blessings in our life, Lord. Just uh, we thank you for the opportunity to gather. I pray that uh, we take this message that we've heard today and take it with us as we leave here, and uh, that we, us, Lord, Lord, I pray that you be with us, protect us, and bring us back again next week. In your name, I pray. Amen. <laughs>